Good evening. My name is Thurman Greco, and the name of this show is Let's Live with Thurman Greco, and it's coming to you from scenic downtown Woodstock, educational TV channel 23, and also from YouTube. And this is, this is a whole new show, and it's been kind of under wraps for a long time, uh, and I have just reached a stopping point on this new book, so I'm going to, I, in Spanish, I'm going to enseñar, I'm going to read this book uh, first, and I think it's very important. This book is called A Healer's Tarot Memoir, and um, it's a fun book, so I hope you'll enjoy it. Tarot is a right brain tool. We respond to tarot's wonderfully pictorial images, just as in dreams. Individual cards trigger inner knowledge and intuition. These tools probe the subconscious, motivating you to find the inner answers engaging self-discovery skills. The skills that I use in tarot are the same as those I use in animal communication. I receive information visually, emotionally, and tactically. And if this seems confusing, allow me to clarify. When you walk into a crowded room, if you pause for a minute, you'll pick up the vibe. The skills you use to pick up the vibe in that room are the same ones I use to read the tarot. Tarot awakens curiosity and creativity, keeping your mind and your heart open. And this shines a light deep within you to your inner self. Uncovering your greatest strengths and deepest secrets, going beyond the limits of your conscious mind to access unconscious knowledge, tarot supports your spiritual development. Tarot takes us back through the mists of time Rachel Pollack, in her books, Tarot Wisdom and 78 Degrees of Wisdom, wrote about tarot history in a way that came alive for everyone interested in the tarot origins of the tarot. Get her books, read them, soak up their wisdom. They are the Bibles of our industry. I also recommend a book, Letters from Heaven, by Abigail Lanzman. Abigail wrote a book and designed a Hebrew letter deck based on her own system of Jewish mysticism. Abigail designed the artwork for her deck and her book, Letters from Heaven, is a foundation in my library. I've read it many times. Every chapter continues to offer new information and spiritual growth. The memoir focuses on the major arcana because those cards explore personal and spiritual development. The major arcana make us spread what it is. It is the heart of tarot. When I read a spread for a client, the cards light up the situation. These insights are just as relevant today as they were in ancient times. Each major arcana card is illustrated with specific symbols and scenarios carrying powerful images referring to archetypes, which is a description for a particular type of person, and they give me access to inner knowledge. When many major arcana cards reveal themselves in a reading, they signal that the situation is not entirely in your own hands. You're not alone in what you see. Because the major arcana cards represent archetypes, they are significant and can influence your situation. Major arcana cards tell us that prior events have set things in motion. Tarot is a path to personal growth. Use your tarot practice to experience the major arcana and interact with the cards especially if you're working on a specific issue. Track your journey through life with a journal. Use a spiral notebook or a binder with loose leaf pages. At the top of the page, write the name of the card and the date of the entry. Sketch the spread if you, want, if you use one and include comments, situations in your life. 
include anything that you feel may be relevant. My story began back in the 1990s. I lived at the time in Virginia in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. A new client contacted me to visit her home for a pet consultation. On my second visit to her home, I met a very interesting woman. Shoshana was a professional tarot reader. On that morning, I became a tarot card reading student. It's significant that I met Shoshana on my second visit to this client. Two is a number of duality and opportunity. And this can happen when a partnership with another person is formed. It also means that two parts of a personality can become balanced. A person is becoming immersed in another person or project. I went home, called Marianne Yatsko, Maria Newberry, and Barbara Kaplan, and we arranged a series of weekly tarot classes. Every Tuesday morning from nine until noon, we breathlessly hung on Shoshana's every word. When she paused or suggested a break, we asked for more. After many Tuesday mornings, Shoshana negotiated monthly tarot weekend sessions. And these events became seminars or workshops or retreats or whatever was appropriate for our learning stage. After a few years, Shoshana took off for the Jersey Shore. I still miss her and the wisdom she shared. And maybe someday I'll see or hear from her. But whether or not this happens, I owe her much. Since the day she took off, I have read every book that I have found about tarot. And I'm pretty much available for a reading at reasonable prices. But that wasn't the whole story. Tarot was and still is an important part of my life. But I kept this skill very secret. Tarot was kind of edgy in Virginia at that time, and for all I know, it may still be edgy in Virginia. My healer skills were pretty edgy too. I was a massage therapist, a foot reflexologist, Reiki master teacher, animal communicator, and I taught canine massage therapy. Massage therapy was just being legalized in Fairfax County at that time, and Reiki was still underground. And I worked at a wellness spa and taught reflexology. Adding tarot to the list just seemed too far out. So I pushed the reflexology and the canine massage therapy. My Northern Virginia clients loved the canine massage therapy. And truthfully, it was and is a hoot. My deepest, darkest secret was tarot. The only way someone found out about the tarot was if they saw a deck in my healing space. I can truthfully say that I practice some tarot, but certainly not a lot. My tarot clients were definitely in on a secret. I had no business cards or flyers. I didn't read cards at parties. One thing I did, though, was read every book that I could find on the subject, and my prices were reasonable. Why? Well, for one thing, I'll never get to the end of the subject. I love to learn, and tarot always has something new and wonderful to teach me. All those books and all those readings have taught me much. Mystery, intuition, everything, all of it. Tarot is my world. And you can do many things with the information on the pages of this book. You can understand yourself better. One of the main attractions about the major arcana is that the cards each represent an archetype. Tarot offers guidelines for future events. It can help you identify obstacles standing in your way. It will also identify resources you can use to overcome them. The cards clarify a difficult situation when they suggest opportunities for change. And tarot does not discriminate. The collective wisdom of the cards is there for all who seek answers. And note, truth is always found in the cards. This is a spiritual connection between you, your hands, the cards, and the person you read for. 
This can happen in different ways. The cards will tell you what you need to know, even though you may not be interested in that specific information. Occasionally, in a reading, the cards will ignore the question asked and will, instead, provide much needed information on a different subject. When this happens, if I have the time and the client has the patience, I will offer another spread. Every time this has happened in the past, the cards did answer the question in the follow-up spread. It's as if the cards felt that the information in the first spread was the most important. In all cases, I read the cards as I see them. On the off chance that the question is simply not answered in the second spread, I believe that the cards were withholding the information. This book focuses on the major arcana, omitting the court cards and the minor arcana. When I read cards, I read the entire deck, which includes all the cards in the deck. These 78 cards are divided into two parts. The major arcana with each card individually named. The four suits of the minor arcana are called wands, cups, swords, and pentacles. The major arcana cards are numbered from zero to 21, with each card individually named. And the four suits of the minor arcana are numbered from ace to 10, plus each suit has four court cards, page, knight, queen, and king. I write about the major arcana cards because they represent archetypal characters as they experience life's biggest lessons. These cards carry us through life's biggest events, encompassing themes, karmic influences, and the mysteries of life. And major arcana cards deal with love, marriage, money, birth, death, downfalls and resurrections. Tarot is an unspoken language all its own. When I moved from Mexico to Venezuela, I thought I could speak Spanish, maybe. In my heart of hearts, I knew I was lying to myself. In Venezuela, I only spoke Spanish occasionally, and then only to accomplish my most basic needs, preventing hunger. My vocabulary consisted of huevos, Tom and Leche. My neighbor, who had lived in the Venezuelan oil camp for 15 so years, communicated with one all-purpose phrase, Escoces con soda. In Mexico, I began by trying to read street signs and other things that I saw on the streets. I tried to speak a little Spanish every day, and my four-year-old daughter went with me everywhere I went because she was my official interpreter. With Michelle's expert help, I was soon conversing in Spanish every day. I could get myself from one place to another. I was able to read street signs and soon was able to make myself understood. More important though, I was able to understand what I heard, saw, and said. When major arcanas show up in a spread, pay attention. Life lessons, lessons are current events here the wisdom found in these cards help you make decisions and create your future. I don't recommend trying to read a set of cards for a person without the court cards and the minors. However, the more you know about the major arcana, the better job you will do of reading and understanding the cards. Each major arcana card has its own outlook on the world. And it doesn't really matter which deck of cards you choose to read the tarot. Whatever the illustrations, the stories are accurate. A good way to learn about the tarot is to use it. Look at each card, think about it. Then look it up in one of your tarot books. Your goal is to get beyond the written words and trust your inner self. When you read the cards and read the books, you tap into the wisdom of the tarot and its readers, teachers, philosophers, healers, and the people they learn from. This wisdom goes back through the mists of time. You call it up in your tarot reading to help you create the future. 
the fool is the first of the, of the archetypes. This card begins the adventures of the tarot. Not only is he the hero in this journey, we can all identify with him. He is our soul, and he is setting out on a quest. Remember this. The fool is a youthful event and can be many things, but he is not foolish. Potential opportunities awake, but they involve risk. Always be willing to take a risk. The fool responds because he likes to stay out of his comfort zone. He invites us to join in a spiritual journey toward a new life. If we do, potential seems to be everywhere. Unexpected adventures are guaranteed. We let go of the past in order to embrace coming life changes. Now is a good time to make a clean break from the dead-end lifestyle habits we don't need anymore. A new chapter is beginning, the start of something new. We've outgrown a phase of our lives, and it's time to take a deep breath as we journey on a new path. We've waited long enough for the right time to leave the safety zone. Our full potential is anxious to develop, and we can no longer ignore the unexpected opportunities. With renewed energy and rejuvenation, we move forward in a new cycle of self-discovery with openness and faith. And this is the fool in touch with his authentic self, discovering knowledge, talents, and abilities heretofore unknown. Amusement and spontaneity are the words of the moment. When you use your living in the moment skills, good times are ahead. Look before you leave. Back in the 90s, I took a massage class. I had already graduated from PMTI a decade before, and Marge Derso, my reflexology guru, was teaching massage a new modality. Our class was small, with only eight students, including Elizabeth. While the rest of us were trying to learn new massage strokes and more about the body systems, Elizabeth flew through the class. It seemed the information went from Marge's mouth straight to Elizabeth's brain and hands. And I think she absorbed the information through the pores of her skin during our clinicals. Elizabeth was on a path. She tapped into a source of potential and was making a new start in life. She jumped into the unknown with her whole being. Her inquisitive mind and heart carried her forward. And after a while, Marge had us gathering our list of people for our clinicals. While we scrounged around looking for people, Elizabeth's list of contact information included those who seemingly appeared out of nowhere to receive a massage. A couple of students began to get a little jealous, but I didn't. I saw her situation for what it was. Marge's massage class was a new beginning for Elizabeth. She was a modern day version of the age old tarot card, the flu fool. While the rest of us wore comfortable student clothing, jeans and sweatpants, Elizabeth attended every class, dressed colorfully and richly, celebrating her total openness to life and anything on the curriculum that day. Elizabeth wore gorgeous shoes. She wore sandals with four inch heels or wedge sole pumps. Elizabeth's shoes celebrated life, love, reflexology, and massage. How did this happen? She saw through the illusion and took a chance on knowledge. But Elizabeth didn't travel alone. Her companions, friends, and her experiences supported her without controlling her. Her healing skills became her power symbols. When the rest of us were afraid to move forward using our new skills, Elizabeth saw the things she learned as possibilities and opportunities, even in new learning territory and difficult chambers. Elizabeth experienced change at every level that she encountered, personal, relational, cultural, and systemic. Elizabeth's fool energy stood for her inner spiritual freedom 
which allowed her to enjoy her new skills and accomplishments. She was able to avoid entrapment. Elizabeth was courageous enough to dance new dances while feeling anxious and uncertain. This gave new thoughts and feelings which she embraced. If Elizabeth feared any unexpected surprises along the way, she never let any of us know. Her confidence and idealism allowed her to be ready for everything. When the class ended, Elizabeth embarked on the next leg of the journey. She danced along to her career, unafraid of surprises which she might find along the way. She went job hunting, carrying her ubiquitous bag, which I felt was filled with magical opportunities. Time passed. The last time I spoke with Elizabeth, she admitted that she had several jobs in a row before she found the best opportunity. Her confidence and idealism carried her through to the best place waiting for her. Elizabeth and her healing embraced the world and all it had to offer. And for sure, Elizabeth is still out there living the fool's life. She calls on us to listen to the child inside and to follow our instincts. Was Elizabeth always right? Of course not. Do I understand what leads her on? No. Her foolish inner core led her and the rest of us forward. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your inspiration. Sometimes I think you were never real, but in the end, I know you were. All of us have a fool in our lives, or maybe we can embrace her ourselves. We just need to recognize it when we see it, or listen for it. When the fool is, appears, get rid of the dead ends. Move on to a new way of life. Your new life may involve a trip, or moving to a new location, getting a new job, or getting married, or divorced. Whatever direction your new life takes, one thing is sure. You're beginning your spiritual path as you seek the truth. This is the start of something new and untested. The fool is a hero for everyone needing a new beginning. Opportunity, adventure, and escape foretell a clean break. Of this you can be sure. Your new journey brings excitement. Your new experiences come with true potential. The fool can represent a new job, relationship, a move, or many things that I can imagine. Whatever or whoever the fool represents, we learn we all need obstacles or problems in any project with a prize at the end. After all, that's how we find ourselves. When you begin your path with a fool, you're moving towards spiritual self-enlightenment. Don't forget, pay attention to all the warning signs along the way and take the time to see the truth that is right in front of you. Watch your step and use your head. The next card is the magician. The magician has all the skills you need teaching, healing, and therapy. Plus, the magician is a good omen in stressful times because of all the positive energy which becomes available. This flees up new information. The magician is a master of change. And the magician represents pure male energy. This card has all the ingredients for your success at your fingertips and abilities. You just need to tap into them. Words and thoughts have immense power. They give the gift of knowledge and learning. And you will develop your untapped potential. The magician knows all about setting goals. He helps you set your goal and then stay focused until you reach it. Sometimes the magician works through another person. This makes this card a good omen with health questions because physical well-being is connected to your spiritual health. 
The magician translates ideas into goals and makes plans. If this is what the what you want, the magician can help you be more creative in your work because he helps people co-create. Some years ago, I managed a small town food pantry. Pantry line shoppers included massage therapists, Reiki practitioners, and other healers. Because Reiki is health care for the soul as well as the body, I taught Reiki classes and attuned interested pantry volunteers. And Kathy was a student. And she stuck with the classes and became a Reiki master teacher and now tunes her own students. She dropped by the pantry monthly and offered Reiki throughout the pantry area of the building. I felt the energy shift as she invoked the Chokure, the Saheki, and the Hon Shazeshon in the pantry room and the hallway. This was energetic healing at work. She offered Reiki to the walls, the ceiling, the floors, as people pushed around the hallway, the bathrooms, the food room, cleaning everything after the pantry closed and before we had to leave the building and she focused on the corners. Reiki, Reiki energy transformed the pantry into a holy space, easing the toxic fear of hunger hanging, like the, hanging in the pantry like an invisible fog. The Reiki erased it as the floors, walls, and corners became holy. Fear of hunger wasn't the only issue. Fear of job loss, fear of illness, fear for the children were palpable. Reiki was a spiritual wind touching those needing blessings and healings. Practitioners know when the time is right. Reiki takes on a life of its own, healing where it is needed, using energy passed through the practitioner's hands. Using Reiki, Kathy extended blessings. When she was in the grocery line, for example, her hands activated and Reiki blessed those in the line. It was then that Reiki became a connection between one's divine and physical selves, aligning the physical and the sacred. Whether, sacred, whether Reiki works in the grocery line, the traffic line, on a massage table, at an accident site, or in a food pantry, the space becomes holy. Reiki treats a person through chakra points located throughout the body. A Reiki session reminds the recipient who she is. This self-awareness opens the chakra portal so that the person can become all she can be. It's hard to get too much of this holy ritual because Reiki is all loving and all giving. And Reiki wisdom guides the practitioner's hands during a session to points of divine connection on the body. No wonder there are no connections to Reiki therapy. Reiki is a light touch applied to a clothed body. When offering Reiki therapy, I often begin a session by placing my hands on the crown of the recipient's head. And after three or four minutes, I move my hands to the occipital ridge at the base of the skull. And then I place one hand on the base of the skull and the other on the back of the neck. After a few minutes, I place my hands or I hover them over the person's body, following the lines of the person's body and following the lines of the person's main chakras. Healing energy travels up and down the chakras, beginning at the head and ending at the feet. And I feel warmth, tingle. I also see images and colors while the recipient relaxes in a sleep-like state. Chakras are the communication system of the body, and chakras share information with one another as they physically, intuitively, energetically, and psychically communicate with each other. They also talk with chakras in other bodies. There is no limit to chakra communication. And finally, the pantry visits themselves are healing. The pantry experience is healing. When shoppers and volunteers heal from the experience, they return to their path seeing things in a new way. This healing, this new vision, 
this fresh feeling makes the person come alive. The pantry serves shoppers, volunteers, and hungry people. Distributing groceries in the pantry brings forgiveness and healing. Reflexology and Reiki therapy teach me that healing happens on several levels in our lives. Physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, and mystical. Both healing and getting well are special challenges because many people in the hallway, the pantry room, and out in the parking lot do not have health care. When the magician appears, healing flows. The magician is a good omen if you're dealing with a health issue because healing is a magical process. The magician considers every opportunity in a positive light. Everything works together. The magician's tools include pentacles, wands, cups, and swords, whatever is needed for success. The infinity symbol sits on the magician's crown. The magician's highly developed intuitive forces can be interpreted as a flash of insight. But however powerful these forces are, they incorporate leadership skills, ambition, seeking action, and new relationships. These important skills make up this mystical powerhouse. The magician announces a new beginning. Using your creative gifts and abilities, he develops untapped potential for decision-making and action. This is a bold and magical step. The magician in a spread shows a developing interest in, in spiritual awareness, which can pair up with magical or mystical arts. Now you can manifest your intentions as you master your destiny. Use your focused mind and intuitive insight to take advantage of this conscious activity. When the empress joins the magician in a spread, chances are a child may become part of the picture. The magician can manifest abundance if the king of pentacles, the world, or the sun join in. The magician influences journeys, brings creativity, and positive energy into your life. Work with the magician as you dig deep within yourself for the strength and power you need to make big changes in your life or the world. And these changes are magical. The bottom line is that the magician and his magic give you everything you need for your success. It all depends on your intention and desire or how much you want it. The next chapter is the High Priestess. The High Priestess possesses a highly developed intuition. Listen to her when she gives you advice. She introduces you to your real self. There's more to her than meets the eye, and she reigns over these things that we cannot see. Her wisdom goes beyond language. The high priestess is all about secrets. She guides you to find answers within yourself. Even though she is the ultimate maternity symbol, she is more professional than motherly, and she is in the know as she answers her own questions. The High Priestess represents feminine spiritual power. High Priestesses sit alone and use their intuition and wisdom for insight and integrity. In the right circumstances, a High Priestess will share both guidance and knowledge. Meditation is good for High Priestesses whose dreams may be prophetic. Other people or places may not have the answers that you need. When a person doesn't have all the facts, answers, or solutions that can't be explained, they will lose their meaning. And sometimes it may take more than one tarot spread to explain or reveal the situation. With the mysterious high priestess, solutions are a process. As things unfold, Spiritual enlightenment and inner growth 
happen. I believe there is a high priestess in all of us to activate the energy. We find her when we decide to go deeper, practice stillness, and examine the unconscious in silence. Personal growth may happen as a situation unfolds. Sometimes she protects her other self when she needs the opposite of what she talks about. When a high priestess learns to be listened to and give advice, she may become an astrologer, a tarot card reader, a palm reader, or a therapist. That way, she uses her skills to heal and guide. You can also include poets, artists, and musicians. High priestesses like to tell about an upcoming period of study and a good teacher on the scene. Susan Fiona Saxman, Woodstock's most famous psychic, is one such person in my life. In a town filled with psychics, Fiona stands out from the crowd. She does readings in her shop, Fiona, around the corner from the Cumberland gas station. Susan sits in her shop with Ghost, her adorable dog, and greets her guests for a reading. Clients are always excited because they've waited weeks or months for their appointments and traveled maybe just hours to just spend an hour with her. Mainly, they are there with Susan to get questions answered and hear from relatives who have departed. They share love from one lifetime to another lifetime. When the High Priestess appears, secrets and potential wait to surface. Something hidden is emerging. The information that she shares comes slowly. For some, this can include feminine spiritual enlightenment and personal growth. She promises reconciliation of opposites. Tune into your inner voice. Pay attention to dreams, imagination, and intuition, because this is where inner change happens. Meditation may help you tap into your faith and belief. If you pay attention, reconciliation is an option. Use your intuition. Never underestimate the power of the high priestess. Surrounding cards will contribute to the outcome. When you're on the right path, you can answer your own questions. Using the energy of your inner high priestess, you can heal yourself. Help comes if you need. The High Priestess is not always a woman. When you connect with the High Priestess, you check in with specific talents. You call on the High Priestess when you need to use your wisdom, enlightenment, and intuition. The High Priestess teaches that the knowledge and understanding you seek is within you. She knows how the universe works and why things work the way they do. She uses her attention and wisdom to teach and protect you as you learn that what you seek is within yourself. And now we come to the, pre the Empress. The Empress is beautiful and creative, the universal mother of us all. She nurtures, procreates, heals, feeds, and supports others. She makes sure our home is safe, secure, and has all the comforts. The Empress is the Earth Mother of the Tarot. She is the ultimate maternity symbol. If there is one word to describe her, it is abundance. When you think of domestic harmony, think of the Empress. And don't forget that she is in charge of abundance. She is eternal, traditional, female, promoting emotional control and congeniality. Rita lived in the Saugerties Palinville area of New York Hudson Valley before Hurricane Irene cost her everything. One day her life was normal and the next day she had nothing, she became hopeless, homeless. A friend we both knew, Maureen, found Rita a worn out pickup somewhere. The owner couldn't sell it or even give it away so Maureen got it for Rita. Until I looked closely at it, I didn't know what color it was. I knew what color the tires were, though, slick and bald. Rita got the pickup and the key that went with it. 
She put it in the ignition and turned it. The motor came to life. It got her to the gas station. When the rig turned over and got into gear, Rita became the embodiment of the princess. She began her new life doing anything anybody needed to have done for $10 an hour and lunch. She cleaned out flooded houses and sheds, hauling trash to the dump. She used her computer skills when someone needed administrative work done. Rita nurtured her way from assignment to assignment each day. Her professional attire came from the free store at the family of Woodstock. She rented a room in somebody's house and was finally no longer sleeping in the pickup. When she worked in Woodstock on Wednesdays, Rita shopped in the pantry. And I will say this about Rita. She never once grumbled. Rita became a creative force working for Harmony wherever she went each day. With a smile on her face, she acted as if the food pantry was the best food that she had ever eaten. And never, not even once, did she complain about the ancient jalopy rig that she drove around. As far as I could tell, she never lost hope. Without hope, I don't think she would ever have made it to the other side, wherever that was. This hope made her a symbol of abundance. For my part, I never once asked her how she got the rig repaired, and I never even looked over near where the inspection sticker belonged. Frankly, I was afraid to ask. I knew she might tell me the answer. Truthfully, Rita was no different from any of the rest of us in the pantry after the Hurricane Irene. She had to figure out how much of her past she could rebuild, and she had to figure out how much of her past she was simply going to close the door on as she moved into the future. Beyond her material possessions, Rita gave up everything standing in the way of success. She gave up her rear vision. Looking back into her past simply did not happen. She gave up bitterness and seeing wrongs. And this means that she gave a person a second chance and even a third when they needed it. She gave up waiting and putting off something because the stars and the planets were not properly aligned. She gave up criticism, and that included self-criticism. Rita was the right person in the right place at the right job to be able to unfold her path. She lived each day as if the blessings were all around her and all she had to do was open her eyes a little wider. Daily, she risked whatever was necessary to rebuild her life. Rita embraced the future while renouncing the past, and she never quit. Rita was the poster child for us all. She lived each day with meaning, even in the worst situation and under the most inhumane conditions. When the Empress shows herself in a spread, the situation is full of promise and potential. Abundance is a possibility with marriage, motherhood, and material gain. When the Empress card appears, a person symbolizing nurturing something to fruition. This includes love, marriage, and motherhood. Material satisfaction and comfort are around the corner. It also stands for writing, painting, creating music, creating a home, and cleaning out garages. The Empress is at peace with herself. The Empress may refer directly to a desire to become a mother. The Empress in a split spread is important for anyone looking to get pregnant, foster a child, adopt a child, look for a surrogate. This same energy can be applied to someone trying to create a new project. This includes a book, TV show, job, hobby, or anything creative. It may also refer to a person's mother. But that's not all. When the Empress card enters a man's life, it represents a masculine attitude toward passion. Renew your life. Plan new ideas for the future. Enjoy your creativity and make the most of your situation and abilities. The Empress supports abundance on both a material and emotional level. And now we come to the emperor. 
The emperor has authority and power and likes to take control of it all. The emperor is a moral figure who conducts himself accordingly. He sets boundaries and works within them. He works with structure, rules, logic, and reason. Readers refer to the emperor as a man, but really, the emperor can be a woman. Women are often the emperor when they structure themselves and their lives as an emperor. This can be an uplifting and powerful card for women who need to become the emperor. The emperor has a reputation as a warrior, but really, he is a beneficent ruler. The emperor has a moral code which requires that he fight for what is right and what is his duty to protect. These qualities assure that he lays down ideals, morals, ethics, and aspirations for those around him. The authority of the emperor requires him to defend it. This is how the emperor teaches those around him about the meaning of power. If something is worth having, it's worth fighting for. You sometimes come into your emperor power when you struggle to be independent, become your own person, and reconcile issues. Emperors become skilled business people, governmental figures, benevolent husbands, or fathers. An emperor is strong and steady and able to take charge in any situation. He is an honest ally. Sometimes a man comes into emperorhood when his father dies. Father issues need to be worked out now. The emperor honors and respects tradition. My father was an emperor for me. Although he is depicted as a warrior, he ruled as a beneficent ruler. In the Rider Waite deck, the emperor wears robes over a full suit of armor. My father wore armor daily. His armor was a bulletproof vest and a sidearm which he hid under his arm in a leather holster. When he was in public, I never once saw my father when he was not wearing a suit coat over his armor. He even wore his armor at the breakfast table. My father, a small town Texas attorney, was good enough at what he did to plead a case in the Supreme Court of the United States of America in Washington, D.C. I never knew the particulars or even the names of the plaintiffs or the def defendants. What I knew was that my mother took him clothes shopping in Austin and bought a special blue serge suit and a white shirt with just the right collar and even more special somber tie just for the occasion. And on or about May the 15th, 1954, he packed himself, my mother, and myself into his late model dark green Oldsmobile 88 and drove to Washington, D.C to plead the case. While we were there, on the day before that he was to plead the case, he drove us around Washington, D.C. so I could see the Capitol, the White House, the Washington Monument, and George Washington University. We didn't get out of the car to walk around the city or even stay the night in Washington, D.C. My father, who always carried a concealed weapon, knew martial arts of the day, had served in the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover and was in the OSS during World War II, did not call attention to himself. He didn't want to be noticed by anyone because he was constantly on the lookout for trouble. And for him, crowds meant trouble. He saw things and people and could pick a person out of a crowd and recognize him or her as trouble. And this was an attitude that I grew up with. After riding around Washington, D.C. all day, we ate dinner in the fish restaurant, O'Donnell's. Fish was not readily available in my hometown, so my father loved the meal. I don't remember what fish dish he ordered, but I do remember that when he ordered for us, he asked the waitress, do you have jalapenos? They were served at every meal in our home. Mother drove across the bridge into Via Cunha, and bought large number 10 cans of them in the bodega there. After dinner, he drove us to Salisbury, Maryland, and we stayed in the Wicomico Hotel. The next morning, he put on his fancy new suit, shirt, tie, shoes, and drove back to Washington, D.C., and pled his case before Justices Robert Jackson, Harold Burton, 
Fred Vinson, Hugo Black, Tom Clark, Sherman Minson, Stanley Reed, and Felix Frankfurter, and William O. Douglas, the Supreme Court Justice of the Day. He then returned to the hotel in Salisbury, paid the bill, picked us up, and drove home to Texas. He drove us nonstop to Texas, taking the short route through Arkansas and North Texas. He returned home to his practice, which was primarily civil, but included criminal cases because he provided whatever source of services his small client, town clients needed. At a time when women had few rights in Texas, my father was known area-wide for doing much for his clients. In divorce cases, he had a reputation for taking everything for his female clients, especially if they were children involved. The first thing he did was clean out the checking account, leaving 15 cents for the divorcing husband. The washing machine went where the children went. I recall every day that he used the word ethical somehow. When the emperor card appears, we handle the material side of life. The emperor is an authority on administrative manners. Moral and ethical behavior are important. He transforms, transforms ideas into reality. Practical changes at home or at work happen. The emperor has the courage of his convictions and actively organizes his life. By taking control, the emperor is in a power space and can control his life. He brings stability into any situation. When the emperor gives advice, take it seriously and act on it. One thing, the emperor is not subtle. He stands for leadership, power, and setting goals. Your results-oriented attitude will assure that you achieve the most of your goals. And now <clears throat> we come to the Hierophant. The Hierophant is an authority figure and a religious spiritually teacher connected with organized religion. Rooted with traditional religious and spiritual beliefs, the Hierophant makes decisions for others and blesses them. He personifies religion, rites, dogma, and doctrine. You seek out the Hierophant when experiencing spiritual growth and development. The Hierophant also helps you deal with old wounds or trauma from spiritual upbringing that no longer works. You need spiritual healing. The Hierophant relies on education and family expectations. That puts him smack dab in the middle of a community church or temple congregation. The Hierophant represents organized religious, philosophical, education, and spiritual institutions. He exerts the authority over its followers. The person receiving counseling usually is presented with a choice whether or not they understand the situation. You pause to build a stronger foundation through tradition and history. You have the option to follow the teachings and obey the rules or break out to find the individual truth. The follower knows that one's own spiritual beliefs, beliefs and intuition are truth. But sometimes there is a need to learn from those with more orthodox experience. This is important to those disconnected from faith altogether and who are looking for something to fill that void. The Hierophant can be a source of comfort during difficult times because of his offerings. He focuses on, people go to the Hierophant to learn, to receive sacraments, for therapy and for marriage counseling. In short, people go to the Hierophant to seek guidance. He is our connection with traditional spiritual beliefs. He passes down spiritual wisdom and unlocks mysteries for us. He represents the quest for the meaning of life. The Hierophant traditionally is a man, but this isn't necessarily so. Women can be strong Hierophants if they want. The first time I met the Hierophant, I was in Austin, Texas, and engaged to a Catholic man 
I was preparing to experience life in a different way. Oh, we are down to five minutes. Well, thank you very, very much, Ellen. This has been a wonderful experience for me, and I hope the audience has enjoyed it as well. And thank you for listening to this portion of the Tarot Memoir. Thank you again. Thank you.